Hey everybody, Leah Klett here, and my guest today is activist and best-selling author Shane Claiborne. We're discussing his brand new book, Rethinking Life, Embracing the Sacredness of Every Person. What I thought was so interesting is in the intro, you talk about how you your own journey to getting to where you are now and how you're sort of a mutt theologically. So I want to hear your your journey of how you got to this place where you wanted to write this book and how you came to the conclusions that you came to that you share in this book. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I've found God in lots of different spaces within the, you know, especially within the, the church world, grew up Methodist, got Pentecostal and got rebaptized, you know, and, uh, leaned into the Catholic tradition, worked with Mother Teresa, all that like really shaped and formed me. Um, and, you know, everywhere I went, there's also a few bones I felt like I needed to spit out, but there was so, so much that was shaping me. And I kind of, you can kind of see that in me and in my writing, uh, even in our, our life here in Philly, there's still a charismatic side of that. There's a liturgical side of that. There's a little bit of, um, all of that, you know, in there. But um, when it comes to some of these bigger social issues, a lot of my spiritual life was really divorced from that um, mm -hmm. because it was much more concerned about going to heaven when we die. And while I think that's important, I, I also think that Jesus talks a lot about not just going up when we die, but bringing the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven and engaging the injustices and the pain of this world. And uh, that that's the holy work of God too, is, is, uh, is, is challenging the things that are crushing people's lives. And, um, and, you know, particularly as I mentioned in the book, uh, when it comes to the language of being pro-life or for life, as I even just kind of like to reframe it gently a little bit is, that I saw on some of these issues, um, Christians not only were silent, but were actually uh, a part of the problem, you know, were obstacles when it came to um, things that I think could save lives uh, when it comes to gun violence or the death penalty or militarism and war or some of these other issues. So, you know, I wrote Executing Grace several years ago to to address the the that the issue of the death penalty and then beating guns around gun violence and i i've found the language of a consistent ethic of life or a comprehensive ethic of life to be really helpful for me you know and and to think outside of the silos of or the isolated issues of of um you know this is the most important issue and just to bro build a broader framework that hey every person's made in the image of god and um that I think particularly the time that we're living in where we've had, you know, one mass shooting after another, the murder of Tyree Nichols uh, um, and um, escalating war in Ukraine. I mean, uh, in executions in three different states last month. It's, it's a it's a really um, ripe time for um, a, a fresh conversation about the value of life. Now, what is your observation about the current state of being pro-life? You talk about how when you became a Christian, that was sort of the issue. I feel like the, the church has been really a victim of um, uh, or, or has been impacted by the culture wars, you know, between the left and the right. And some of these conversations get framed where the minority voices um, on the far left or far right really um, hold progress um, hostage, you know, from seeing some real changes. Um, I think that's true on almost every issue. Um, and, you know, I, I, I do talk about abortion in the book and um, the fact that uh, a lot of us would like to see a reduction in the number of abortions that happen. And, you know, um, the thing that the, one of the biggest things that's listed as a reason for having an abortion is financial stability and the, the ability to feel like um, the, the family's able to raise a new child. And um, and so what would help with that? You know, well, I think things like having access to child care and affordable health care and um, other things that um, uh, some of those that would say they're for life have blocked some of those policies, you know. Um, I also think that like we, there's a lot of folks that talk about 
common sense gun laws, you know, things that even though I'm not a gun owner, um, I, I believe other folks have the right to own guns. Um, but I think that there should be, you know, even as the writers of the Second Amendment said, there should be some reasonable um, uh, restrictions and regulations around that, uh, the limit that a gun can shoot without reloading, the number of gun, handguns one person can purchase in a year and things like that. And I think we can have a better conversation on abortion too. Because um, a lot of times people act like there's just, people randomly in the last trimester of their pregnancy that decide to abort a kid for no reason. And I'm yet to find that person. I, I know people that have had abortions late in their pregnancy and everyone that I've talked to, it's because either their child or the, the either the child or the mother's life were at stake and it was a wrenching decision. Um, so there's not always like compassion and even reality <laughs> you know as we talk about some of these issues yeah i mean you know a lot of pastors have courted controversy for saying that there are biblical reasons to vote democrat and biblical reasons to vote republican um do you think either party upholds a more biblical worldview than the other in the policies that they present the reason i wrote you know another book called jesus for president was because i believe that christians should transcend partisan politics and um uh you know as as we say in that book uh, that our our the old hymn is right that our hope is built on nothing less than uh jesus blood and righteousness and all other ground is sinking sand so we say you know uh, our our fidelity is not to the donkey of the Democrats or the elephant of the GOP, but to the Lamb of God and to center Jesus. Um, uh, the irony is that I think that some of the teaching of Jesus is much more radical <laughs> than what I hear on the left or the right, you know, um, that um, the idea of loving our enemies. Yeah. What does that mean? Uh, and and some of these issues are not like, for instance, um, our military spending is unprecedented, uh, it, but that's not a partisan thing. You know, Obama raised Bush's budget. Trump raised Obama's budget. Biden raised Trump's budget. So we just keep spending, you know, what what's now, I think, uh, twenty five thousand dollars a second on militarism and war. And, and we have weapons that have the capacity of 50,000 Hiroshima bombs. And we're the only country that's ever dropped those kind of nuclear weapons on uh, civilians. And we did it twice in one week. So what does it mean to champion life, you know, on all fronts? Um, on the issue of immigration, I think it's so clear in scripture and from Jesus's teaching, Matthew 25, when you welcome the stranger, you welcome me. You know, as the New Testament says, when we welcome the foreigner, we might be entertaining angels unawares. As, as the Old Testament says that we are to welcome the, the, the foreigner as if they were our own flesh and blood. Um, so this is a constant thread in scripture. And yet we've got some really terrible policies on immigration. Um, and this is by, not, not partisan. Some of our highest numbers of refugees and asylum seekers have come under Republican presidents. I think some of our worst policies have come uh, in recent years and continue under the current Biden administration. So um, I wanna be better at, um, at welcoming folks that are leaving situations I can't even imagine um, of, of persecution and of, of poverty and abuse, of fear. Um, so that's why, you know, I think that that Jesus is really my sounding board for these things. And um, a lot of this, this is not about left or right, but it's about right and wrong. And it's also about what does it look like to be a Christian? <laughs> you know, uh, it looks like welcoming the stranger. Like that's not a Republican or Democrat thing. That's that's a Jesus thing. You talk a lot about how um, being close to some of these issues does change your perspective. Talk about your time spent with some of these intentional communities and what you learned from them about how we can better reflect Jesus to the world. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I wrote a piece in Newsweek. You might have seen that this week that talked about the importance of proximity. It's a theme of of rethinking life. It's it's true in my own life. Is that uh, you know it's very 
we're, we're very good at having opinions about people we don't know. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, we're very good at having um, sound bites and bumper stickers and T-shirts. And yet those really don't come with much responsibility. They don't have to come with responsibility. So the framing question that I keep, you know, almost like a, uh, what's it called when, it, you know, in a song, like the refrain that I keep coming back to, um, the chorus of the book is, is what does love require of us? Mm -hmm. What does love require of us uh, when it comes to abortion? Um, what does love require of us when it comes to gun violence, when that's the number one cause of death of American children, right? So if the, the real framing question is, what does love look like on the death penalty? How do we love the victims of horrific, evil, violent crimes? without mirroring that violence through capital punishment and calling it justice, you know? So what does it love it look like to have restorative forms of justice? I, I think that's the, but for me, proximity is where, you know, all this started. Um, I grew up with guns, uh, hunting, and yet uh, living in North Philadelphia and now seeing gun violence all over our country and not just cities, but in rural areas and workplaces. And I mean, everywhere we can imagine um, uh, the toll that it's taking on human life, uh, that became personal. I mean, it became personal when a 19 year old was killed on my front steps. Wow. Um, but it also became personal as I got to know heroes of mine that I write about in the book, folks like Sharon Risher, whose mm -hmm. mother was killed and her family was killed in uh, Emmanuel AME Church during their Wednesday night uh, prayer meeting and Bible study. Uh, and, and yet she's convinced that killing is the problem, not the solution. It's why she's concerned about gun violence, but it's also why she's concerned about the death penalty and police brutality and violence. Um, all these issues are they intersect and they're very connected, especially for those of us that that operate under the understanding that every person is equally created in the image of God and their life is equally sacred. And that, that's you know kind of why I wrote this book. But you know, it's visiting folks on the border and hearing their stories and um, and that they're also there are twelve thousand people in front of them as they try to have a court date around asylum. Um, you know, those are the things that humanized and that also showed how dysfunctional some of our systems are. Getting to know folks on death row that were wrongfully convicted. Um, and, you know, as I write about the Newsweek piece and, and in the book, some of them were um, guilty. They, they were rightfully convicted of the crimes that they were responsible for. But doesn't mercy and grace uh, have anything to say for those of us that are Christians, especially. Um, don't we believe that Jesus was right when he said, it's not the uh, healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come for the righteous, but for the sinners. And and doesn't that, you know, have implications on, on whether or not we're going to execute someone because of the worst decision they ever made. Um, so, but but it's hard to have that urgency and that compassion if we don't have the proximity yeah yeah your book is definitely and you say this it's it's hard it's kind of heartbreaking to read some of the the stories you tell the statistics you share what is the solution how do we ad address some of these really difficult issues without the death penalty without guns well truth is often hard i mean we we, we especially in the christian tradition we have this um reverence and this appreciation for uh confession you know that with repentance comes confession that the truth sets us free that we're to share our sins with one another i mean this is a part of our tradition is is that a part of our healing comes from being honest about our past and if we're going to have a better future um then we need to address some of the things in our past so we think about that personally but we don't necessarily um do that same reckoning, I think, as a country. We're very good at forgetting the things that we want to forget <laughs> and remembering uh, that, that, that history tells a different story of America than often we're taught in our history classes, uh, many of us anyway. Um, and 
we've been sometimes good at remembering the victimizers rather than the victims. And I think you see that in, in a lot of parts of our, uh, our, our national history, it's the battle over monuments. And I, you know, I talk in the book about um, the Nathan Bedford statue, Nathan Bedford Forrest, the founder of the KKK, uh, his statue was in the capital of, of Tennessee until just a couple of years ago. So, you know, the, the, it is about history and, and in some ways critical race theory and some of the ways that we try to distract from the truth and from those hard questions. And I think the truth can also be beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, two things can be true at one time. Someone can tell truth and tell lies um, or tell truth from a certain perspective that leaves out another part of the truth. Um, and I think that's true. You know, when we look at some of the people um, that I talk about in the book. I mean, I quote some of the early Christians yeah. because their words are true and they're beautiful and they've shaped who I am and who the church is 2,000 years later. Um, they also had some serious blind spots. Um, I think uh, some of the anti-Jewish sentiment that I talk about in the book that began to make its way into Christianity as these are the people that killed Jesus. And, and that began to really uh, be a poison in some of the theology that um, surfaced during the Nazis, but even during Martin Luther, you know, and others that were very anti-Semitic. Um, I think Martin Luther had some great truth that he he that that resonates in my soul, and some things that, um, uh, as, as Scripture says, he saw through a glass darkly. Um, you know, there were things that he missed. Um, but isn't that true of all of us? You know, I, and and I. Um, I think it's important to think, you know, to say yeah, Thomas Jefferson had some good visions and language for what America could aspire to be. He also exploited a, a young girl at the age of 14 that he would be in jail for if he did it today. You know, <laughs> so I think we can like be honest about some of those things, but that's hard, you know, for some people that if we only want to see the heroes of our nation or the heroes of Christianity without seeing uh, the, 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 um, the shadows that they had um, and the, the places where they had holes in their theology or they tr spoke truth in, on, on one thing, but um, uh, they didn't say thing, they didn't get Jesus's words quite right on another. So anyway, I think that's all part of the point of the book. And there's others, you know, such great work being done all over the country with the 1619 Project with, um, we're reading Ibram Kendi's book right now, Stamp from the Beginning. My wife's reading that to me as, uh, uh, you know, and, and we're, um, I think we're wrestling with some of that as a country. So mm -hmm. it's only appropriate that some of the writing in our, uh, that particularly theological or Christian writing would also be doing some of that reckoning and truth telling. Well, Shane, you're very critical of the death penalty in your book. We've been talking about that, but I am curious, what do you think is a good alternative to the, the death penalty that would effectively reduce crime? I know this is a very tricky subject, but I'm so curious about your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, it is a, helpful the backdrop that I, I argued for the death penalty uh, for a lot of my life and very right. passionately in high school I had all the verses I thought defended it and and a couple things happened um, I, I got to know folks on, on death row and I also got to know murder victims family members um, that really feel like the violence is the problem not not the solution. It's not going to heal the wounds to kill the person who may have killed their loved one. Um, so what do the alternatives look like? I think most of the world has figured this out. When I was born, most of the world was using the death penalty. Now only, I'm, I'm going to just throw it all out there, Leah, um, you know, 47 years later, most of the world has abolished the death penalty or is not actively executing people. And there's only a handful of countries that are. The United States is in the top five often or always in the top 10 top executing countries in the world. And it's not a list that we should be proud of. You know, China's number one, Saudi Arabia, um, Iraq, Yemen, a few other countries are, are also still executing people. Um, so I think that we can keep society safe 
from people that are imminently dangerous. And I think there are people that are imminently dangerous, like Dylan Roof, right. who carried out the massacre in Emanuel AME. He's unrepentant. He wanted to be executed. He wanted to be a martyr. He wanted to spark a race war. Yeah. Um, and yet I believe that um, the the family members of the Emanuel Nine are right when they say that gee, we've got to hold out hope that God's love is bigger than Dylan Roof's hatred and that maybe even God could transform his heart and the death penalty takes away that chance. So I do think that Dylan Roof should uh, is is dangerous and that it's appropriate that he should be incarcerated. Um, I also think that someone can can change and I've seen it from people that I've visited on death row, sometimes over a course of 10 or 20 years that they're a different person than they were 20 years ago. Some of them, it's because of what Jesus has done in their life. And I, I believe that someone can change. Um, I believe that's why Jesus interrupted an execution in the Gospels and, and said, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. And my goodness, if that doesn't make it clear that none of us are above reproach, but none of us are beyond redemption either. I mean, I think that's really two powerful truths at the heart of the gospel. And mm -hmm. one of the places I would say I've held on to my Methodist theology is the Methodist statement on the death penalty is that uh, that capital punishment um, denies the, the work of Jesus to transform, uh, to redeem, uh, every human person to restore, redeem, and transform. I think it's the words that they use in that. Um, every person. So, um, yeah, that that would be my. Uh, and and I, I think that the you know in executing grace, they go into a lot of detail about what restorative justice can look like. Right. Mm -hmm. That um, what does heal the wounds of violence, um, and can someone who's done something terrible eventually participate? in healing some of the wounds or preventing someone else from doing what they did, you know, and I give some examples of that, some real concrete examples. Um, I think there's other frameworks for justice that are not restorative. And one of those um, is the idea of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, which has its roots actually before scripture even existed, but we also see it in scripture. And the idea was that you could do reciprocal harm that you could hurt someone back, but it limited the harm that you could do. You couldn't harm them more. And in fact, you had to harm them in exactly the same way that they had hurt you. And that's why I think it's so, that, that it is important that stopping the spiral of violence was a really good framework for justice at a certain time. But Jesus as the fulfillment of the law, as we say, right? Like, says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, but I tell you this, love your enemies. And he's going to, I believe, mm -hmm. really blow it out of the water when he says, you know, that, that you know, we, we may have, we may have heard that before, but there's an even better version of justice that doesn't return harm. And mm -hmm. it's what many of our parents taught us, two wrongs don't make a right, mm -hmm. that we can do better than mirroring the harm. And that's exactly what the death penalty does. Um, is, you know, we, we, Leah, if you poke my eye out, we, I don't think many of us would say justice is me out actually gouging your eye out, mm. um, or cutting your arm off. If you cut my arm off, um, we don't rape people who rape to show them that rape is wrong. And yet in the most extreme case of murder, we still do hold to that logic that we, are going to kill to try to show that killing is wrong. And, and I actually think it does something to us, you know, as a society, it, it, when we continue to hold on to that logic that is such a contradiction to the gospel of Jesus. And I, I think there's also a whole another side of this, which is um, that this is very connected to some of the other conversations around race um, and uh, the 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 death penalty really developed in our country in those same states that held on to slavery the longest mm -hmm. and where lynchings were happening a hundred years ago is where executions continue to happen today 
And so there is, there's a race piece of this, you know, that when we, a hundred years ago, when we moved from lynching African-Americans to legal executions, 75% of those uh, executions were African-Americans. Wow. And now it's not that high, but it's still disproportionately high. Uh, half of death row um, are African-Americans. And a third of the executions, even though it's 12% of our population that's African-American, um, are, are African-Americans. And other people of color make it even higher. You know, And so we, we kind of think that we're, we're holding out the death penalty for the worst of the worst. But the truth is we're using it for the poorest of the poor and disproportionately for people of color. And what determines who actually gets executed is not the atrocity of the crime, but it's arbitrary things like the resources of the defendant and where the crime was committed and whether the victim was white or a person of color. Those are determinants that as you look, they're very haunting to think of how broken our system is. Um, and that's why groups like conservatives concerned about the death penalty raise the question of, can we trust the state with capital punishment? You know, imperfect systems that have this irreversible power and they are not getting it right. For every eight executions that we've carried out, we've had one exoneration. So that's one person that was sentenced to be executed that was able to prove their innocence. I mean, that's a really bad track record. You know, if you think like, out of every nine planes that took off, one of them crashed. Um, I think we'd stop flying and figure out what was going on. And yet that's kind of um, the, the case with the death penalty. So um, I'm encouraged that this is also not a partisan thing, but there's many Christians of all stripes. But it's also those states where Christians continue to be in power. States like Oklahoma and Texas and Georgia and Missouri, Alabama, that continue to have uh, the death penalty. So if Christians resolve to be done with capital punishment in the name of Jesus, uh, we would stop executions overnight. So in your book, you write, faith is not just about having new ideas, it's about having new eyes. Can you tell me a little bit more about what you meant by that? Yeah, so the, the fact that we can begin to see people differently. Martin Buber talked about you know the I vow, that we see someone... Uh, not just on the outside, but we can see that they are a temple of the living God, that the the, the spirit of God is in someone. As Dorothy Day said, um, um, the, the only true atheist is the person who cannot see the image of God in another person. Mother Teresa said, when we look into the eyes of the poor, we see Jesus in his most distressing disguises. Um, and, and so I think that sense of reverence for life um that even someone um that's done something terrible like some of the folks that we're thinking about you know that have carried out murder that um if we have eyes to see as jesus said we can see that they are that there's nothing um that can completely put out the light in you, as the Quakers say, that there's something of God, something holy. We're made in the Im image of God. Um, and so I think that changes everything for us. You know, it changes the way that we think about other people, even when we see them at their worst. It changes how we engage uh, around hard conversations with people we disagree with, if we kind of hold that reverence. Um, and, and also that we're not just looking externally at people. But we're finding that no matter, um, you know, what the color of someone's skin is or what their hair looks like or, uh, you know, their, anything about them, it, it, what, what transcends all of that is the reverence that they are a child of God made in the image of God. And, and that, that changes everything. So when it comes to the topic of life, you know, life is all sacred. What do you make of the push for medically assisted suicide in countries like Canada, where some people are choosing to end their lives because of issues like depression or anxiety? This is one of those complicated things that I would say um, the 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 pro there's some common themes in, a, in in rethinking life that I would say um, 
connect with this question, this important question you're asking. And some of it is proximity, right? Is like knowing the people that are suffering in these situations um, and feeling like what is God? The question I would always be asking is what does love require of us? And what is God's most perfect will? Um, and uh, I think if those are the framing questions, we might not all make the exact same decisions in the, in in the in in the same context but we've got some guiding principles um i tend to believe on every single issue we should try to make someone's life um uh to advocate for their life and for their dignity um and and to extend that life um uh to make that life viable um which is why I write, you know, about Down syndrome and some of the other issues, I think, where um, we've seen life a little bit more expendable. Mm -hmm. um, and um, um, and I have a lot of friends who do hospice care. And, and in one sense, that's what the work that I did in India was in the home for the destitute and dying. And I held people's hands as they died. And it was interesting because it was seen as a holy thing. Um, that every day we would go in the streets and we would bring people in who were dying without someone holding their hand. And that was Mother Teresa's passion is no one should die without someone holding your hand. And when you go into the morgue, it says, um, I'm on my way to heaven. And when you leave it, it says, thanks for helping me get here. And one of my friends said, it's like we're travel agents. You know, we're, we're, we're helping people transition from this world to the next. And we get to whisper God's love to them uh, and to, you know, massage their muscles and make that as um, the least scary and the most holy experience that it can be. Um, so, you know, that's the work that I think's before us. Um, I, I, you know, I don't talk specifically um, about euthanasia in the book, but I do think that you know, I use Mother Teresa or I, I refer to Mother Teresa as a really great example of that because of how consistent she was, but also what hard work it was. You know, love, is the, the love that we're not, we're talking about is not just a sentimental anemic love, but it's a really, um, it, it's, it's a daring, costly kind of love that, uh, you know, can keep us up at night and, um so, I, but I think that's that's the love I see in Jesus. It's a love that's willing to die, but not willing to kill.